Hi folks and welcome back to Retirement Roadmap with Master Plan Retirement Consultants. I'm Evan Fricks and with me as always financial advisor and retirement planner Mark Fricks. Today we're jumping into part two of our federal employee benefit discussion. In part one we covered the federal employee pension known as FERS. Today we'll be discussing the retirement savings vehicle of the federal employee, the Thrift Savings Plan or TSP. Mark, is it fair to say that the TSP is the federal employee version of a 401k? Yes. Perfect. <laughs> Incredibly, it's very extremely fair. fair. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what it is. It's their ERISA slash 401k, 403b plan. And, and just to be clear, you know, it's so funny that uh, federal workers are, are, are so uneducated when it comes to their retirement benefits, I don't mean in an ugly way. They just, the government's not teaching them, which is where we step in. But even to the point of confusion between their FERS annuity and their thrift savings plan. And so just again, to be clear, let's start at ground zero. Uh, you know, the FERS pension is a monthly guaranteed check mm -hmm. like Social Security. That's not what we're talking about today. Today we're talking about the 401k, which is where you can put money in, the government can match up to a certain amount, and it's a bucket of money to help offset income gaps in retirement. So when can an employee start to contribute to their TSP? Um, I don't think there's a waiting period even. You know, that's a great question. I've never, never been asked that, but pretty quickly. In fact, my understanding is, is when you sign up with the government, they automatically go ahead and uh, have you fill out the paperwork to begin contributing. The problem is, is they start off uh, like with a 1% because they're going to automatically put in 1%. You can put in zero, they'll still put in 1%. Um, but also, I'm noticing in the past, they automatically put you in the G fund. We'll be talking about what that is later, but it's, it's the government bond fund and it's the least effective one, at least from a standpoint of growth. So, but I don't think there's a waiting period. And then, uh, you know, if you just make a note and, and, and remind me to, to, to check that out, but uh, it's, it's, it's definitely within a year and it may be immediately uh, when you start employment. Yeah, we'll do a little uh, disclaimer at the bottom there exactly. with, the, uh, with the correct answer. Um, a, a couple of just really simple background information, annual contributions of up to $22,500, um, $7,500 for the catch up. Mm -hmm. If you're 50 or older, you can start putting in the extra $7,500, absolutely. Yep. Payroll deduction only. Right, it has to come from your pay, uh, out of your paycheck. Uh, you can't write a check into it or anything else like that. Um, so that's it's it's automatic and and it's it's really almost like a um, you know the hardest thing to save is spending that money. But with this coming out of your paycheck, you don't see it. So right. it's really a good way to do it. And there's a Roth option as well. Absolutely, and this is something a lot of people are not aware of. So you know traditional versus Roth. Uh, so real quickly, the difference is traditional is for every dollar you put into that thrift savings plan, it's like you made a dollar less on your taxes. So you get a tax deduction. Uh, feels good this year, okay? Um, but uh, the Roth portion is you do not get a deduction, but it's never taxed again. It grows tax-free and it comes out in retirement tax-free. I really like the Roth. That's a fairly new addition the last three to four years, so that's why a lot of people are still not aware of it. You don't go to the TSP website to sign up for it. You go into, I think it's Employee Benefit uh, website to sign up for it, but then it, you control it in the TSP website. I love the Roth. Just be careful. If you're doing six, eight, ten percent in, into the traditional and suddenly you swap all of it to the Roth, your paycheck's going to drop. So, you know, either uh, get with me, one of our initial uh, consultations that are complimentary. I can kind of help you uh, kind of set up a plan to do that. Uh, but don't do it all at once because it, it can throw off your paycheck. Suddenly you can't buy groceries. And for those who might be fairly new to our series, um, can you briefly describe the difference between the traditional 401k and the Roth portion? Yeah, and that's, that's, that's kind of the, um, the power of the Roth is that, you know, if you're in retirement, uh, we have no, uh, no idea what taxes will be in retirement, right? Whether you're five years from retirement or, or 35 years uh, away. But we do, we are under the belief that taxes will be more in retirement. $32 trillion in debt, Social Security going broke, Medicare going broke, programs springing up. And so, you know, if you, if you do the traditional, 
you have a little bit less tax burden this year. That's called micro thinking, as we like to say. We prefer macro thinking that uh, I may not get quite the benefit this year, but I will never pay taxes on that money again. I don't care if rates go to 90%. I'm not paying taxes on that money. So really like that, that concept. We, we really love the Roth. Um, I'm hoping it'll be around from now on. Who knows, right? Tax laws and all those laws are written in pencil. But while, while it's there, take advantage of it if you can. Again, have a plan going in, though, because it can, again, mess up your paycheck a little bit. What are the matching provisions for the TSP? Yeah, so basically, again, if you put nothing in, the government's going to put in 1% of your salary, okay? But past that, they will match you 1% for every 1% you put in up to 5%. So if you're putting in 5 they're putting in five. And there's a little bit more to that formula, but that's kind of the basic rounding up. If you put in 10, they still will only put in five. So uh, also important to know too, that the match currently, even if you're putting 10% into the Roth, that match is gonna go into the traditional. Right. Now there is the, the Secure Act 2.0 did say that they could switch that. Any 401k can say, okay, we'll match to the Roth. I don't see that happening a lot because I think it kind of hurts the taxation for the corporation. Right. But it being the government, maybe they don't care because I don't know if the government gets a tax deduction. Go government doesn't pay taxes, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it may not matter to them, uh, but hopefully that's coming. That would be a great thing to have. Free money into the Roth would be really good. Great. Great. So um, there is a lot of detail that goes into the structure of the TSP um, and, and how you contribute and all that other good stuff. Um, so I would recommend if anyone is watching this and wants more information, check out uh, some of our seminars on our website. That's masterplanretire.com. You can find our seminar schedule. We have in-person seminars as well as webinars. So those are online. If you feel like staying in your pajamas that evening, uh, join us online. Uh, we Not only do we walk you through, it's about an hour and a half altogether. We've got room for the uh, Q&A at the end. So if you have any mm -hmm. specific questions you want to ask, you can throw those on the chat box. Um, so those are really helpful. We get into a lot more detail on all the federal uh, topics. Um, but I'll do you one even better. Um, if you have more questions or want some one-on-one uh, -on -one discussion, uh, go to our website again, masterplanretire.com. Schedule an initial consultation with this gentleman uh, sitting next to me, Mark Fricks. Um, you can pull up his calendar on our website, schedule now, find a time that works best for you. Again, you can meet us in person, come into the office, we'll buy you a cup of coffee, or you can do it over Zoom. And of course, we leave room for phone calls as well. That's 770-980-9262. So moving into the sec uh, second part of the TSP, investment choices. So this isn't mm -hmm. just a bucket of cash unless you want it to be. Right. Uh, but we can invest those funds. Can you talk a little bit, uh, bring us through the, the funds that are yeah. available? Yeah, so when the Thrift Savings Plan was first put together, uh, they wanted it very simple. So they only have five funds. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, many 401ks will have 30, 40, 50, 100 mutual funds. Um, and so I, I kind of like the simplicity of it. Um, it, it's not robust enough that you can really explore every seg segment of the market. But if you're not getting any help, then you know just pick two or three funds and leave it alone. You'll probably be fine over a 30-year period. Um, I will mention real briefly, we do here at Master Plan manage thrift savings plans. And if that's something you're interested in, mention it mm -hmm. when you sign up for the consultation or mention it in the consultation. I'll show you how it works. Uh, research says actively managed. 401ks and thrift savings plans get an average of 3% better return after fees. And so just want to mention that. But So there's only five funds. Uh, again, keeping it simple. I will say this real briefly. Um, most people don't know this, but the company that manages the TSP, the money management fund or firm, is called BlackRock Investments. They manage about 75 to 80% of the TSP. Now, they got that contract because they were the cheapest bidder. Um, I guess that's fine. <laughs> People managing your money, they're the cheapest out there. But the reason they're cheap is, uh, Evan, as you know, is they're not really going in there making a lot of changes. They're just following an index. An example, the, the C fund, C stands for common stock. It just follows the S&P 500. So it's got good, bad, and ugly. Now, is that bad? No, the, the S&P 500's averaged between 6 and 8% for 80 years. So that's okay. I'm just saying, don't. It, it's, they're not in there making decisions. They're just letting it ride, so to speak. 
Uh, and so that, you know, if that, that's okay. But if you're getting closer to retirement, talk to us uh, because you can't afford a 30% drop, um, you know, a year away from retirement or two years away from retirement. So that's when it becomes even more important to get some guidance, maybe some management as well. But five funds briefly. The G fund is a bond fund. Bonds are loans. These are government bonds. So you're loaning the government money through that fund, right? And they're buying all different 10-year, 20-year, 30-year treasuries, uh, all these kinds of, of, of bonds. And so you're, you're not really going to beat inflation. The G fund has averaged about 3.2% over the last 25 years. Inflation is closer to 35 to 4 So I call the G fund a parking spot, not a travel lane. Okay, so it's a good place to park if maybe you feel like or we feel like if we're managing it that the markets are going to get rocky. We go and rest for a while. I'd rather make three than lose 30, right? And so it's a parking spot. Don't travel there. You don't want to make 3.2% for the next 30 years. You'll never make any money mm. based on inflation. Uh, the next fund is called the F, as in frank, or as in fixed income. So these are also bonds. So these are also loans, but mostly corporations. Slight bit more risk, slight bit more reward. Average of about 5 to 6%, except last year it lost like 12 because the Fed messed with the rates, okay? <laughs> so there's a reason they did, but they did. And so it did not do well last year, but it, it also can give you a little bit of a flavor if the market conditions are right. The other three funds are all stock funds, okay? So we've already mentioned the C fund, top 500 companies in the, in the U.S. It follows those companies. The uh, S fund, S stands for small. So these are the next 4,500 companies in the U.S. A little bit more risk, a little bit more reward, probably averaging nine to ten percent. The C fund, seven to eight percent. Okay, and then finally the I fund. I am not a fan of the I fund, as you know, Evan. It has underperformed with more risk. I stands for international, but they kind of pick and choose the companies and the countries following different kinds of various indexes. So it's not really a method to the madness that I can see. And that's why uh, they have had more losses over the last 20, 25 years with a less return. Their return is less than 6%, yet they're the riskiest fund in here. Okay, so not a big fan of that. So those are the five basic funds. Um, I will mention briefly the life cycle funds. Um, not a big fan of those because you're, you're required to keep a certain amount of money if you choose that circle in certain parts. Well, if you're retiring in 20 years and you choose the 2040, they've got 20% of your money in the G fund. Why would I have 20% in cash if I'm 20 years away from retirement? So not, not a big fan. We might sprinkle in some if we're managing just to pick up a few extra things here and there, but they just consist of those same five funds. So the life cycle fund is essentially a pie chart made out made up of the five funds existing within the TSP. Exactly. They're based on your retirement date, supposedly right. how many more years you have left. However, when you actually look at how they're divided, from our experience, they seem uneven for the goals set forth on those. A lot the in the table. G, yeah, which is a cash position. A lot in the I, which is not performed very well. And I'd rather have the choices of moving in and out of these as opposed to, hey, we're mandated to keep 20% in the G fund if you're in the 2040. So uh, that's why I'm not a big fan of those. Gotcha. Yep. And there are a couple of things that I, I kind of wanted to mention while you were talking, but I, I almost don't know if I should say this to scare anyone. The G fund, like you said, is the most conservative. It's, you know, if you're retiring soon or even uh, want to balance out maybe an aggressive uh, portfolio, throw some more into G. But the government actually reserves the right to freeze the G fund. Is that correct? Yes. During bad times, they can actually freeze the G fund. I think up to six months, I, th I think is what they can do. I think there's a limit. But if you're living off your TSP or G fund or whatever, and you need money at that point, you can't take it out. Uh, now they will reimburse you for the growth during that time. But I like, that's one of the reasons why I don't like to carry the TSP into retirement. It's much more restrictive. Mm -hmm. uh, as, as we talk about, you know, five funds versus the world, Right. If you can roll that TSP into six or eight different buckets with six or eight different jobs, you know, Evan, the story I love to tell is, you know, the TSP is, is a big bucket of money. It's probably your biggest bucket. Um, it has one job and that's to grow. 
It grows, goes. You put money in, they put money in, the market grows over time. Uh, at retirement, there's six or eight or ten different jobs you need. You still need some growth, but you need some short-term growth, some longer-term growth for medical, uh, some mid-term growth, some tax-free growth, some tax-free income, some guaranteed income. And so there are various tools that do a better job of just one big bucket trying to do eight different jobs. And so, again, that's where we really get into the, the, the meat of the planning is when we start looking at that TSP, how we can put it to work in your retirement and make it more efficient, more efficient. Right. And we, as Mark mentioned, we do offer active management of your TSP, but also the federal employee can go in and make those adjustments. How many times a month are they allowed to? Twice. Twice a month. Mm -hmm. um, and so Mark does that with certain clients too, who prefer, hey, just shoot me an email blast. Um, shoot me an email blast. That's that's my that's Georgia vernacular right there. Shoot me an email blast. Uh, shoot an email blast my way. Let me know. Give me some All recommendations. All that good college training you had. Absolutely, just out the window. been gone. Put to good work. Um, uh, yeah, just talk to my mom on the phone for thirty minutes, and then it all goes out the window. Um, yeah, so that that's super helpful. We we do that for some of our clients as well. So we've got the five funds. We have the life cycle funds that are made up of the five funds. Then a fairly recent yeah. development is the mutual fund window. Yes, the, the vaunted mutual fund window. So uh, the government, they were getting complaints, uh, specifically the TSP board in Birmingham, getting complaints that there weren't enough options. And so they went way the other way. And, and so what I mean, well, they created a window in your TSP. And so you have to kind of go to a different spot to buy that window, okay? And that window opens up into over 5,000 mutual funds, okay? So now you got choices, don't you? So, so many that I wouldn't know really where to begin, okay? Now, this is the problem I have with that. Number one is way too many choices, okay? Number two is each of those funds has their own expense ratio. It could be a quarter percent. It could be 2%. You don't see it unless you read the prospectus. So now you've increased your expenses. Each time you buy or sell one of those mutual funds is $29, okay? So you go ahead and do five, you do the math. You've just spent some money. It also costs you, let me look at my notes here, $55 a year annual admin fees and then another $95 annual maintenance fee. So they're nickel and diming us to death on this. Uh, you are limited. You can only do 25% um, of your total TSP through the window. So if you have 100000 you can do 25000 through the window, okay? Um, and that is the minimum is 10000 So that means if you've got 40000 you can put 10000 through the window. Again, I mean, we might use one or two funds out of that window if we can't find what we're looking for in those five funds. But we have we ask permission first. You know, do you are you willing to pay thirty dollars for a trade because we think we can increase your return by this much because this is not found anywhere else in the other five funds. Otherwise, uh, again, not a proponent. I think they just went way. Let's use another southern vernacular here: hog wild okay, on this, and 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 too much money. I don't know why they're charging so much. This has been around for a year now, over a year. And people still don't know about it either. That's the interesting part. It really didn't get a lot of fanfare. Maybe they sent out an email and said, hey, this is here and you missed it or, or whatever. But that is available. Again, not a big fan, but, but it's there. What are the options for the federal employee uh, pre-retirement with their TSP concerning withdrawals? Or is that stuck in the TSP until they're ready to stop working? What are we looking at? Yeah, so so the, the gosh, about five years ago now, they... they they loosened up the rules around the TSP. So now it is much better. Um, it's still not a great vehicle for retirement and it's still not perfect even while you're there. But if you're 59 and a half, now this is the key, if you're still working, but at least 59 and a half, you can do withdrawals on a monthly basis, quarterly basis. Um, the really cool thing, Evan, you can do is you can do the uh, in-service age-based rollover. And so let me just touch on that briefly because it's a powerful tool. Uh, used to, you could not touch your TSP until you were past re uh, leaving the government. Mm -hmm. So now, as long as you're 59 and a half, you can actually take that TSP and begin formulating your retirement plan by opening, uh, with our help or your own help or whatever, individual IRAs so that you're ready for retirement. Go ahead and get them in the right vehicles. So 59 and a half. Uh, and still working. It's an in-service age-based rollover. It does not close your TSP. 
you still contribute. Uh, it's a tax-free rollover, so all of that's good, but it lets you get a head start on retirement. Um, so that would, that's one powerful tool. Um, anything else, if you're under 59 and a half, you really can't do anything with your TSP unless you retire. If you retire at age 57, now you can roll that over into those IRAs we just talked about, okay? Uh, be careful, okay? Because if you roll it all over into IRAs, um, you want to keep some of your TSP because if you're 50, not 59 and a half, those IRAs have a penalty. The TSP, you can touch it at age 55. So people that don't understand the federal system can mess you up. So we want to leave some of the TSPs for liquidity purposes, okay? So I know we're covering a lot of detail stuff here, but hopefully something's flagging a thought in your head and you're like, wait a minute or whatever, and you it, it, it triggers you to call us or, or email us or something to say, let's get a little more detailed about this subject right here because I may be in trouble or I may be thinking about doing something that's going to get me in trouble. So a great question. You touched on it a little bit earlier as well. Uh, why would someone roll over their TSP while they were still working to begin with? Yeah, again, it's to go ahead and get those um, that money into the buckets that are going to do the job. Let's say that that uh, we, we run an income plan for you and you see that you're $1,000 a month short at retirement. Well, if we can go and get that into an income producing bucket and let it grow for three years, it's gonna produce more income in three years, it's ready to go. Whereas if you wait till three months after retirement to start even thinking about that, it, it, you may not be able to start income for a year or two from that bucket. Now you're kind of stuck with having to take money out of something else, hoping you know, that the market's up. So it's just, it gives you a head start on planning. And again, if you've got, you know, 50,000 places you can put it. And let me give you an example. Did you know you can purchase precious metals in an IRA? You can't in a TSP, but you can. In a, did you know you can purchase a rental house in an IRA? can't do that in a TSP. So it just gives you the world. The world is your oyster right. uh, as opposed to this little dot that is the TSP that has five funds in it. So we're running short on time. Um, I did want to reserve some time to discuss the TSP life annuity, if we could do that Ooh. really briefly. This is a really important topic. <laughs> it's important because it can really mess you up. So there's a button on your TSP page that if you're old enough to begin withdrawals or rollovers or whatever, it says, you know, roll over to another IRA or one of the buttons says TSP life annuity. Basically what that is, uh, Evan, it is uh, an annuity, but it's, it's the worst kind you can get. It's called a SPIA a single premium immediate annuity. So let's say I push that button because it says, if you push this button, Mark, uh, we're gonna send you $2,000 a month for the rest of your life. And I'm like, wow, between my furs and social security, another 2,000, I'll be great. Let me tell you what, what happens here. Number one is that payment never goes up. Okay, number two is you pass away, that money's gone. So if you roll over $500,000 TSP into this lifetime annuity, which is sold by MetLife, by the way, okay? MetLife has just sold you an annuity. It has no death benefit uh, and no beneficiaries, okay? So you pass away, uh, that money's gone. Now, hopefully you live past the 500,000, okay? I don't wanna take that gamble. I want the kind of annuity that grows while it's still spending out money. I want my payments to increase. And if I pass away, I want my kids and grandkids to get everything left that needs to come to them. So please don't, if you're thinking about doing that, don't do it. It even advertises it on their yeah. TSP, uh, I'm sorry, on your, um, yeah, TSP statement. It did up until last year. I haven't seen this year's statement, but it has a little advertising, advertising, advertisement on the end, on the, on the edge of the, of, the, of the statement that says, hey, you should really do this. You get $2,000 a month. Please be careful. Okay. Yep. Great, great. Um, if, uh, if this video applied to you uh, and you happen to miss our part one, I would highly recommend checking out our YouTube page, the, uh, the part one of our federal employee benefits discussion. Um, again, check out our website, Master Plan Retire, for contact for Mark's calendar, schedule your initial consultation, as well as links to our podcast and the YouTube page, um, seminars, webinars, all that schedule is featured on the website masterplanretire.com and our phone number is 770-980-9262. Mark, any parting words with our audience today? Yes, if you go to their website, bookmark it because you're going to be able to go back there for new things all the time. There's things there. There's a checklist that if you're a federal worker and you haven't completed that checklist, don't retire, okay? We help you complete that checklist. Push that button, schedule an appointment, you meet with me, me personally, okay? Whether it be Zoom or face-to-face, -face, and we will just kind of run six, eight reports for you and let you know where you're at. So hopefully you'll do that. Hopefully I'll see you in the future. And until we do, remember, 
Plan well and prosper. Take care, everybody.